Good morning, saints, and welcome to our Bible study for this Sunday. Uh, we're glad to have you with us, and certainly a welcome to any guests or friends who are with us. Today we're continuing our study of the book of 1 Peter, and today we're looking at chapter 4, chapter 4 of 1 Peter, and it's entitled Faithfulness in the Last Days Despite Suffering. Faithfulness in the last days despite suffering. So let's uh, bow our heads in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. We thank you, dear Lord, that he suffered, that we might avoid the suffering of hell at the same time that we might endure the suffering by association with him in this life. Help us, dear Lord, as we study your word to remember that uh, earth is not our home, heaven is, and that you are with us, and that the only thing you really require of us is faith, and even you give us that. So, dear Lord, give us ears to hear and eyes to see your grace and your mercy, and to apply it to our daily living. In Christ our Lord's name we pray, amen. So, saints, if you open up your Bibles again to 1 Peter chapter 4, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. Now, first of all, what is this chapter about? Well, Peter, you know, Peter, the uh, really one of the chief apostles of the Lord and disciples, he continues in his first epistle with his teaching on the subject of faithfulness despite suffering. And the suffering that we have is balanced with our hope in Jesus Christ. That's what gives us the ability through faith to keep going, to keep going. Peter reminds us of the fact that life on this earth is temporary. It's not forever. And we certainly know that during these times of COVID and the other difficulties that confront us. Uh, Peter reminds us that our true citizenship is in heaven, not here on earth. And he reminds us that the ultimate victory lies ahead for us in heaven as we trust in our Lord Jesus Christ. So he lets us know that Christ is with us in every circumstance of life into which we invite him. You see, a lot of times we close him out, but whenever we invite him, he is there. In fact, I would say he's there even if we don't invite him because he is faithful when we are faithless, his word says. But Peter reminds us that we never need to suffer alone because Jesus has been with us. He knows what suffering is about. He suffered uh, for us in the past or suffered with us in the past. And uh, he will be with us in our sufferings in the present. We need not to be fearful of the future because Christ is with us. He suffered for us. He suffered with us now, and he'll be, he'll be with us with any suffering uh, that we are confronted with. In fact, you see behind me and above my head, you see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane pleading with the Father that this cup of suffering would be taken away. But he said, let thy not my will be done. So, uh, saints, let us now turn to 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, we're first of all going to look at verses 1 through 6, living for the will of God. And just as a little background, remember once again that since Christ suffered in the flesh for us, we should be determined to stand up for him in this life. Amen. So verse 1. Therefore, since Christ has suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind, for he who has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. It means, this means, saints, that as Christians, we must have the resolve to suffer patiently if it is God's will, because Christ suffered for us. Since Christ resolved uh, to do God's will on the cross, we must be content as well to suffer for him, should that be the case. And you know, as we believe in Christ, as we proclaim him, there will be suffering and there is suffering. Verse two, that he no longer should live 
live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. You see, sin has no power over those who are determined, okay? Uh, we must be determined to do what is right. Determined to do what is right. Verse 3. For it would be sufficient that we did the will of the Gentiles in the former time of our lives. In other words, we lived in sin before, meaning we deliberately did the things that unbelievers do. When we walked or lived in licentiousness, in lust, in drunkenness, revelry, drinking parties, abominable idolatries. That's verse 3. In other words, we're reminded here how as Christians we lived before our conversion. We were immoral. We followed evil's desires, drinking, partying, worshiping idols, at least they did. But we too, we end up having idols too that we love more than God. And sometimes the greatest idol is ourselves. So Paul here reminds us about living for the will of God by remembering what Jesus did for us and remembering how that changed us from the way we used to be. Peter goes on to say, in which they think it's strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Now here, he was not just talking. He begins by talking about where we used to live. And, and now he's talking about the people we used to live with or the ones we used to run with in sin. He's saying our former friends will wonder why we've changed. They're going to think that we're hypocrites. Okay, and that will be a form of suffering. Verse 5. They will give an account to him, however. I said they will give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. You, you see, we will be judged for the things we would have done or did, but we will have forgiveness because we called upon him. But our friends and neighbors, associates, those who did not receive him, those who did not receive us as we tried to share with them, or even if we haven't, we have to remember that if we did love them or do love them, that they're going to make an account as well, except they won't have faith in Christ to fall back on. Uh, because it, And it says both the living and the dead. Now, when it says the dead, it means people who uh, do not know Jesus. They are the living dead. They're walking around in this life without Christ, and as a result, they're headed for eternal death and destruction. Verse 6, for this reason, the gospel was preached also to those who are dead. For the reason that if they don't have Christ, they're the living dead now, the gospel must be preached to them. As it was preached to us who used to be the living dead. Amen. And it said that they might be judged according to men in the flesh but live according to God in the spirit. They were dead in their lifetime, but now that they have the gospel, the gospel is preached to them that in their death, they may be saved from destruction. They may live eternally with God. Uh, so it is the former life and the life that they have through faith in Christ and the life to come. Uh, that they will be with Christ when Christ returns. So we see it says, but that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, because we'll all be judged, but live according to God in the spirit. I mean, we're saints and sinners. Uh, but that since Christ has come, since there's faith in Christ, they can have eternal life by preaching the gospel to them. Amen. So we move on to the fact that Christ could come at any time. The end is at hand, verses 7 through 9. Peter writes, but the end of all things is at hand. In other words, the end of the world is at hand. Christ could come at any time. He says, therefore, be serious and watchful in your prayers. Be sure to listen to God's word and respond to it. Continue to pray. 
be watchful in your prayer, meaning be diligent, be serious in praying for others, especially those who do not know him and for yourself and for the house of God and finally yourself. He says, and above all these things, okay, above you have your prayers and above even that, have fervent love among yourselves for love will cover a multitude of sins. In other words, continue to have uh, an abundant love, unconditional love for each other, saints. Because when you have that, you're able to forgive the sins that you commit against each other. In other words, it says it will cover a multitude of sins if you have fervent love, continual love, strong love, passionate love. Okay, It will cover up those sins. You'll forgive and you will be forgiven. Verse 9, another way of showing uh, being watchful is to be hospitable to one another without grumbling. In other words, love each other fervently, be fond of guests, treat them with the greatest hospitality. Amen. Amen. So the way we are watchful about the Lord's coming is to be prayerful, love one another, be hospitable, be open and loving to others who are not of the house of the hold of God. Amen. Now as we move on further in our scriptures, verses 10 and 11 reminds us that we are called to ministry. When we become disciples of Christ, when we become believers, we are called to a ministry, a ministry. 10, Peter writes, I kept saying Paul, but it's Peter. As each one has received a gift, you and I have it. Minister, minister it to one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Saints, we are called to minister to serve one another using the gifts that God has given us. Some are preachers, some are teachers, some are hospitable, okay? There's so many gifts that you have. Some are wonderful speakers, writers, so many gifts. We are to use them in service to others. That the grace, the gift of God that has been given to us, the love of God may be given to others. And then Peter specific. 11, if anyone speaks, let him speak as oracles of God. So if you have the gift of preaching, preach it so that people will know Jesus. If anyone ministers, meaning you take care of the needs of others, let him do it as with the ability which God supplies. So there are different levels of that. That in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ, that God gets the glory. To whom is the praise and dominion forever and ever. God should get all the praise because God has all the authority and the power forever. He's eternal. So we're called to minister to the needs of each other. This is how we remain faithful. We remain faithful in times of suffering in these end times or last days by our prayers, by being hospitable to each other, by loving each other. Okay, by using the gifts that God gives us to serve others. This is how we remain faithful. And God gets the glory. And then there can come about the suffering that comes about as a Christian. That we should not be surprised or shocked by what happens to us when we serve the Lord be, be, because as the Lord was treated so will we be so these are this is verses 12 through 19 uh, and that ends the chapter verse 12 he says beloved okay brothers and sisters in Christ do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial which is to test you in other words saints don't be surprised or shocked that you are going through a testing uh, that it's like walking through fire because that's the way God was, was treated so you will be treated and this doesn't happen all the time but it can happen and at times will happen so he said don't be surprised by it because this is the way the world treated Jesus he said instead be glad you are suffering 
the way Christ suffered for the faith for God. 13, he says this, but rejoice in so far as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. You're being involved in the same type of suffering he received. And we know how he was ridiculed, made fun of, how he was eventually put to death. That when his glory is revealed, when Jesus returns again, you may also be glad with exceeding joy that you have eternal life with God. Verse 14, if you are reproached for the name of Jesus, I mean, pardon me, if you are reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you. Count a blessing when you suffer for Christ because it is an honor, okay? For the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. This suffering that you're receiving proves that the spirit of God really lives in you. On their part, he is blasphemed, but on your part, he is glory. So when they uh, cause you to suffer, or when they do these things, they're blaspheming God because you're God's suffering. I mean, God's servant. But on the other hand, you are glorified by what you do because the spirit leaves in, lives in you and you will have eternal life with God. Verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer, a thief, an evildoer, as a busybody in other people's matters. In other words, if you're gonna suffer, suffer for what is right and good. Don't suffer for what's for, for doing wrong, amen? And uh, verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed but let him glorify God in this manner. In other words, suffering for good brings glory to God, to the Christian and to the church, okay? Suffer as a Christian, but don't be ashamed, be proud of it. Verse 17, for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. When the Lord Jesus comes, the church will be the first to judge because the church knew better, okay? Knew better. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? Excuse me. If we're going to be judged, how much worse will it be for those who, have, who, have, who will not receive the gospel? Realize, saints, we'll all be judged, but we'll be judged or found innocent. Others will be judged and found guilty. In verse 18, it says, quoting Proverbs 11:31. And if the righteous one is scarcely saved, where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? Okay. So in other words, if persecution is ongoing and, and if persecution, if, if judgment falls upon the believer, in this case, the righteous one, and they barely, we barely make it by the skin of our teeth because of what Jesus did. Okay, not for any of us, not anything we did. Uh, what will the ungodly and how or where will the ungodly and the sinner appear? They will be in big trouble. That's why we have to keep preaching the gospel, preaching the gospel. Verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God commit their souls to him in doing good as to a faithful, faithful creator. God will keep us going when we do what is right and, and uh, commit ourselves to him. Okay, so it says here, therefore, let those who suffer when will of God commit their souls as we suffer, we commit our souls, our bodies, our minds, all that we are to God. No, he's in control of everything. Okay, we do and when we do good, we're, we're, we're doing right by giving this to a faithful God. Knowing that God will never save you, say it will not will never fail us. It said God's will keep Will, will keep us as long as we're doing what is right and we trust ourselves to God. He is with us and he will never fail us, okay? So, saints, that's that chapter, chapter four. What do we learn from it as he tells us how to be faithful? We have to continue to be faithful through suffering. How are we being faithful by loving people, by praying, uh, by being hospitable? Okay, that even when suffering comes, we just keep at it. We keep believing. We keep trusting. We don't become like the evil that's befallen us. So, what are the lessons, lessons, saints, that uh, 
we learn uh, from uh, chapter 4. Well, first of all, in the last days, which we are in now, the last days are considered those days between Jesus' uh, ascension to his return. In the last days, we as Christians should have an attitude of commitment. We should have an attitude of commitment. Therefore, since Christ suffered for us in the flesh, we should arm ourselves also with the same mind of Christ. For he who has suffered in the flesh, our Lord Jesus, has ceased from sin. He doesn't do sin. That he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lusts of men, but for the will of God. So, so uh, the Lord Jesus had the attitude of commitment to doing the work of the Father. And he didn't get involved in the things of the flesh. We should do the same. Our second lesson is Christians, we should live with an attitude of wisdom. We, we should have a spiritual thoughts and things here in the mind. Uh, Peter writes, for we have spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles. So they say, wait a minute, that's the way I used to live. I don't live that way anymore. Peter realized we have all spent enough time living like the world. Now we are called to live like sons and daughters of God. It is a profound and foolish waste of time for us to live like the world. And we must simply stop being double-minded and start living as Christians. Saints, you can't have, as we wait faithfully, you can't have one foot in the world and one foot in the church. Okay, that's foolishness. Okay. Our third lesson, as Christians, we should live with an attitude of serious prayer. We talked about that. If we really believe that we live in the last days of this world, it is all the more appropriate that we give ourselves to prayer. Prayer is very important. We must give ourselves to serious prayer, especially as we see the weight of eternity rushing toward us. Jesus can come any time. We dare not take the need for prayer lightly or for granted. Next, we must give ourselves to watchful prayer, serious prayer and watchful prayer. We should have our hearts and minds watching and looking forward and ready for the return of our Lord Jesus Christ. But this also means watching ourselves, but watching this world, measuring our readiness for Jesus coming. And of course, every generation as Christians, we believe the Lord's coming. We don't know when, but it could be today. Or well, the Lord could wait so that more people will come to know him. So our next lesson is Christians, we should live with an attitude of love. We have uh, the wisdom. We have prayer. Now the attitude of love. It says, if these are the last days, if this is what Peter is telling us, then it is important for us to love those who are going to spend eternity with us. It's important that we love each other as a church. They will know we are Christians by our love. Where love abounds in a fellowship of Christians, many small offenses and even some larger ones are readily overlooked and forgotten. Okay, Love covers over a multitude of sins, remember? But where love is lacking, every word is viewed with suspicion, every action is liable to misunderstanding, and conflicts will abound, okay, even among believers. So it's important that we have this agape love for each other. Next, our next lessons. As Christians, we should endure trials with the right attitude, the right attitude. We should never deny the place of suffering in building godliness in our Christian life. Suffering, trials, trouble, they build a, a godliness in us. In other words, a dependence upon God, a need for God to be with us, to call upon God. That's what suffering, trials, and troubles do for us. Uh, though there is much needless pain we may bear, through a lack of knowledge or faith, there's also necessary suffering that we have to bear too. So we must remember that suffering was a suitable tool for Jesus 
it also suitable tool for those of us his servants where we're, we're going to have troubles in life and trials due to our own foolishness at time and we're going to have trials and sufferings because of our support of christ but we have to see the right attitude these are ways for us saints for you and for me to grow in faith grow in godliness to be like him as that picture once again in the garden he, he said, Father, take this away from me. That was his flesh because he was suffering. But once again, he said, your will be done. And that way, the Lord Jesus, who is God, he just grew in what he already was. Because the scriptures say that uh, he grew in both favor of God and man. Amen. He just did not sin. Uh, verse, not verse, but our next lesson as Christians, we should understand the difference between suffering as a Christian and suffering for evil doing. Follow me? Okay. Suffering for the name of Christ is a blessing. Once again, it builds our godliness because it shows that we are really following Jesus. If you've had no troubles, you have to wonder, okay, what's going on? Have I really been following the Lord or have I been playing to the masses? You see, we know there's glory, there's praise from God for us, a praise given to God if we suffer because it means that we are identifying with him. Once again, as the world has treated me, he said, it shall treat you. Suffering as an evildoer, however, is just the opposite. Suffering as an evildoer is deserved and it will bring shame upon the name of Jesus. If you consider yourself a Christian, you proclaim yourself a Christian and then you do wrong things, you're going to get what you deserve, but it will bring shame, dishonor upon the God you claim to serve. Peter recognized that not all suffering that Christian experience or Christians experience in this life is suffering in the name of Jesus. There are times when we slip and do the wrong things, and that's when we need that repentance and love and mercy. And so our final lesson is we should commit our souls to God in the midst of our suffering to remain faithful. Because now, saints, especially in these times of the world, which has rejected God more and more, it is a time of fiery trial for the children of God. The ungodly will have their fire later, meaning we deal with our troubles now, but in the end, our troubles will be removed. The fire we re endure now purifies us. It, it, it makes us uh, stronger and tougher saints of God, while the fire that the ungodly will endure will punish them later. Yet we always remember that there is never any punishment from God for us in our suffering. It's only our purification. For the Christian, the issue of punishment was settled long ago on the cross, where Jesus endured all of our punishment. It was all placed upon him that we should never face God, an angry God, with punishment if we truly believe. You see, the same fire that consumes straw will purify gold, and the same fire it, and, and pardon me, and uh, the fire is the same, it's just as hot, but its purpose is different. Even so, Christians do suffer for the same things that the ungodly do. If this nation is ungodly and does ungodly things, our leaders it will fall upon us too. But for us, it will be to purify us, to make us stronger for the ungodly as a punishment. So even so, we Christians do suffer the same things as the ungodly do, yet the purpose of God for us is different, and the effect is different between us and the ungodly or the unbeliever. So saints, that's our, um, our Bible study for this Sunday, this Sunday, uh, September 9th, pardon me, January 9th. Uh, it's about being faithful in the midst of the trials and troubles of life. Saints remain faithful to God. Follow him, believe in him, trust in him, and practice your faith. And when you fall and you will, we all do ask forgiveness. Share the faith with others by the way you live. Amen.
So once again, we at St. Philip are still um, in house, in person. Saints, be careful to get your booster if you haven't. Be careful to maintain your distance because the numbers are going up. Uh, and be careful to wear your mask. Keep trusting in God, believing in God, and knowing that he's working his will through all of this. The only other special announcement is, as I said before, it's always service at 11. We let you in at 1030. But the other is that Dr. King Day is coming up the following week. On the 16th at St. Philip, we will offer some special liturgy in remembrance of Dr. King. But the next day on January 17th, there will be the Dr. King Day celebration at uh, St. Paul Lutheran Church Menard on the west side of the city. Uh, the church is pretty close to Oak Park, uh, but it's in the city of Chicago off of Austin Boulevard. And uh, continue then to pray for us as we pray for you. Continue to read your scriptures. Continue to trust knowing God is able. So God bless you and keep you. Next week we'll move, I think it's to our final chapter, 1 Peter chapter 5. God bless you and keep you. Amen. And once again, saints, Happy New Year.